Okay, so I'm Jason Harson. I'm the director of the new Center for Media, Communication, and Global Change. And I'm happy to be kicking off the, the, uh, the center's um, debut here with um, a fabulous um, set of interlocutors um, and some AUP professors as well um, around the question of the, of the generations of democracy. It's, this event is co-sponsored by the Center for Critical Democracy Studies here at the American University of Paris. And we're really pleased to, um, to welcome you um, on Zoom, uh, and to those of you who are, are appearing here with us on site tonight. So um, this is a very interesting to understate um, book. Um, as my colleague Julian Culp here said, it's, it's, it's striking in the sense that it's in, in between a collection and a monograph, and it's very accessible for a large public to read about some of the most uh, important questions of our time, arguably, right? Um, so I have here today, if they may not need much of, a, of an introduction, but we have, thank you, Stephen. Yes, I still need to get uh, used to looking into this thing. Um, Craig Calhoun, I first ran into Craig's work as a graduate student um, with, of course, the very popular um, collection that he edited on Habermas in the public sphere and have been reading about him ever since. Craig is University Professor of Social Sciences at Arizona State University, and he was pre previously the director at the London School of Economics and Political Science and president of the Social Science Research Council. His books include, as the book jacket here says, um, The Roots of Radicalism and Nations Matter. Uh, Dilip Parameshwar Gankar um, was a fellow graduate student of mine back in my Northwestern days. Uh, no, Dilip is director of the Center for the Transcultural Studies and Public Culture at Northwestern University. And I did have the honor of working under him um, as a graduate student at Northwestern. Um, for many years, he was the editor of the influential journal Public Culture that many of you have probably read and was a director of this, this center that, that um, his his co-authors speak about that was so um, fruitful for them intellectually, the Center for Transcultural Studies. And then of course, uh, Charles Taylor needs no real introduction. He's, as according to many, um, many commentaries, he's one of the most influential and prolific philosophers, living philosophers in the English speaking world. Um, so we're especially honored to have him with us here tonight. And then at my side here, I have um, Stephen Sawyer from the History and Politics Department and Julian Culp. And then Ilaria Cozaglio in Frankfurt at the Goethe Institute, who is um, connecting with us. Uh, so, without further ado, I'll, I'll let um, Ilaria begin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, as uh, Jason said, I'm Ilaria Cozaglio. I'm a postdoc in Frankfurt, and I've been working on political realism as a methodology in political theory and on some. Um, substantive issues like legitimacy and populism from a, from a realist, perspective, realist perspective. So now you know where my comments also will come from. Um, and before signing, I want to thank you, Jason, for the invitation and for giving me this chance to read in this book, to comment in this book and to dialogue with the, with the authors. I just want to say a few things about the book. It's, as you said, an extremely rich book, which provides the reader with a overarching and multi-faced view on what is going on with democracies, but it's also very accessible. And I think this is something worth mentioning because this is one of the main challenges that one faces when trying to put in so much content and still try to reach as many readers as possible. So I wanted to say so. Um, so for my commentary, I was assigned chapter one by Professor Taylor and chapter six by Professor Gaunkar. So I will mainly focus on these two chapters. But of course, some of the themes I will raise are uh, present and underline all the other chapters as well. And so what I will do in my commentary is to push the authors on some questions that I think stem from the thesis of the book and on some assumptions or views that implicitly recur in these two chapters and that I want to problematize. What I will not do is to divide my comments into chapter one and chapter six, because I think another merit of this book is the author uh, integrate their perspective very well and they dialogue with each other when they disagree and so I thought it was more interesting to just have a bunch of comments uh, that you can uh, react to. Um, I will divide my commentary in five points. Um, so the first one uh, is about the role of conflict for democracies. Um, in both chapter one and chapter six, 
I read between the lines an ambivalent uh, position towards the role for, of conflict for democracies. So whether it is just a hard fact of politics that we have to tame somehow, or whether it has a is it also a valuable feature for the political sphere. And so relatedly, whether there are good and bad types of, of conflict. So I give you some examples. I, I just mentioned quickly the introduction. At some point you write, I'm quoting, that democracy is almost always contentious. Citizens pressing their different agendas are agonistic, but not necessarily antagonistic. And you also write, and I quote again, partisanship can be constructive or at least manageable when subordinated to the concern for the public good. Um, I read a similar positive understanding of conflict also um, in, chapter, in the chapter by Professor Taylor, uh, who seems to implicitly agree on that conflict might have a positive role when criticizing the fragmentation of audiences um, and that um, people never encounter dissenting opinion. And that, of course, is problematic. And similarly, in chapter six, in Professor Gonker's chapter, um, it seems that internal conflict can counteract forms of majoritarianism. As he writes, I quote, majoritarianism springs from the perennial temptation to do away with the laborious negotiation between parts. But still, um, you both also seem to imply a negative connotation of conflict. So for example, when you write that democracy requires common identity because solidarity requires it in the first place, or when you write that the health and stability of democracy is predicated on keeping class struggle under check. So my question is, is conflict just something bad that we have to face as we're living in a non-ideal world, or does it have some emancipatory potential? And if the latter, how do we distinguish between conflict that helps revitalizing um, and renewing democracy and the one that makes it degenerate? So is the generative conflict the one that is polarizing um, or, the one, that, or um, the one that leads to exclusionary politics, for example, as Professor Gaunker seems to suggest um, in his chapter? And relatedly, I wonder if we can think about some institutional setting that would announce positive conflict. So what I had in mind when reading your chapters is the literature on mini publics. Um, there, there are recent, recent proposals about agonistic mini publics as opposed to deliberative mini publics, right? Where in the latter form, the idea is to reach consensus, while in agonistic mini publics, the idea is that every participant represent a partisan position. Uh, so I'm wondering whether something like this, um, by creating spaces for institution, institutionalized conflict, might help people feel less marginalized and would therefore counteract against processes of withdrawal from uh, democratic participation. My second comment uh, regards the difference between true Democrats and populists. So, um, and I will play a bit the devil's advocate here, I have to say, but um, some of what you denounce when reconstructing the degeneration of democracy resonates with what populists claim about politics and with how they justify their political agenda. So in, the, in their narrative, they seem to appeal to the same principles that in a sense compose the telic concept of democracy. So I was thinking to people like Margaret Canovan, who wrote that, I'm quoting, uh, populists see themselves as true Democrats, voicing popular grievances and opinions systematically ignored by governments, mainstream parties, and the media. And also, as of course you know, scholars have underlined that uh, democracies and populism have something in common. For example, Mark Warren recalls that, I quote, democracies emerge from distrust, particularly of elite power holders. And Canovan again argues that populism is a shadow cast by democracy itself, and that it functions as a corrective force towards enhancing um, the representativeness of political institution. However, we can also see that the populist proposals in practice actually go in the direction of eroding democratic practices, and they lead towards more demagogic interpretation of politics. So in this sense, we want to draw a line, I guess, between a truly democratic understanding of politics, which serves, of course, then as a basis to critique existing democracies and a populist understanding of it. So now, and here I'm really playing the devil's advocate, if a populist read your diagnosis of the degeneration of democracy might say, yes, exactly, that's exactly what we've been 
uh, going around saying that these are the problems and, and this is how we are justifying our political agenda. So I'm thinking of examples like when you talk about the loss of efficacy on the citizens part, for example. Um, the populist political agenda and their critique of representative democracy in, in favor of more direct uh, forms of democracy is justified exactly in terms of citizens' lack of influence on political matters. So my question is, how can we isolate the populist version of this complaint from a non-populist diagnosis of the degeneration of democracy? So at some point, uh, Professor Taylor um, mentions that there exists good populism, which is non-exclusionary um, populism. So I was wondering if this is the key to track the distinction between a populist reading of democracy and a non-populist analysis of the degenerations of democracy. Or um, if the key to distinguish this lies in what Professor Gaonka writes on modern citizens who are, I'm, I quote, reconciled to living under a representative system and therefore efficacy must be measured compatibly with the fact that political representation always entails a lack of direct intervention on the part of citizens. So in general, I'm curious to know more about where you draw the line between true Democrats and populists, as this seems to me relevant to locate your diagnosis of uh, the degeneration of democracy. And what's your position in general towards populists? Because it seems to me that um, Professor Gaunker is more um, straightforwardly critic um, and think of populism as a sign of degeneration, while Professor Taylor is more agnostic about this, at least because he concedes that there are good forms of populism. So I'm, I'm curious to know um, your thoughts about this. Um, the third point I want to raise is about the role of social movements for democracy, um, because that also seems to me um, Ambivalently, ambivalently connoted in your chapters. So on the one hand, social movements seems to favor political fragmentation uh, because they're focused, as, as Professor uh, Taylor says, on two specific themes, and they often do not invest on a sort of like more overarching picture of what we should do in politics. Uh, but on the other hand, there seems to be room for claiming that the activity of social movements can actually contribute to the development and the evolution of the Taylor concept of democracy, as they can raise new political stances, make marginalized voice, voices being heard, and so on. Um, this, for example, seems to be implied in, in Professor Gaunker's, Gaunker's view of direct action. Also, it seems to me that social movements might increase the capacity of the people to actually have influence on politics, right? Because the act of protesting, for example, can put pressure, real pressure on politicians in order to revise their political agenda. Um, so for example, Professor Gaunka writes uh, pages on the fear of direct action, the fear of masses, and the fear of social movements. And when I was reading them, I was thinking whether this fear isn't ultimately the fear of conflict rather than the fear of those towards those that are actually raising uh, protests and riots. Um, and so if we think that social movements might have a positive impact on the evolution of the Taylor concept of democracy, I wonder if we shouldn't rehabilitate at least some forms of conflict as good for democracies rather than treating them just as hard facts of, of uh, politics. Um, my fourth point is about the role of the subject's perspective for diagnosing uh, the generations of democracy. So, when I was reading your, your chapters, I was not sure which perspective we should take when we elaborate such diagnosis. So whether this diagnosis is based upon the internal perspective of subjects to democratic regimes, and therefore depends on their perspective of whether a democracy is well-functioning or not, um, or whether the diagnosis is based upon some external objective observations about how democracies are functioning, which then depends on whether a given democracy is actually uh, performing well according to some objective standards. Um, so, for example, in the introduction, you write, I quote, that frustrations rise when people experience disruption or deterioration in their lives and communities. And this seems to show that the diagnosis of the generations of democracy depends also on something that is not just objectively or externally assessed, as for example, the level of, in of inequality is. Um, 
Other examples come with your discussion, for example, of the sense of citizen efficacy or the loss of confidence in the representative system, which you indicate as one of these spirals uh, alimenting the path of uh, degeneration, as Professor Taylor suggests. So again, this seems to me more dependent on the internal perspective of those who are subject to the democratic regimes, rather than on an external or objective evaluation of what's going on. So is it the citizen's perspective on whether they feel to have a say that counts for diagnosing a degeneration of democracy? Or is it an objective consideration about whether they actually have a say um, that counts here for, for making this diagnosis? And if both, what about cases in which there is a discrepancy between some kind of external evaluation and the citizen perspective? Um, I'm asking because I feel that a lot of what happens, for example, with regard to populists, uh, and their success originates within uh, this discrepancy. So for example, some populists think that citizen, citizens' lack of efficacy is due to the disinterest and corruption of professional politicians, right? And we know that things are more complicated um, as what populists detect as a lack of efficacy is just due to the fact that in a representative democracy, people don't have a say on any single matter and that the challenges pertaining to political representation are often independent of the goodwill of the politician. Um, scholars have also underlined that populists tend to think of the people as a homogeneous unit as if they all have the same interests and, and, and worldviews. And once we abandon this view, with this view, we realize that efficacy should be commensurate with the fact that people have conflicting views and not everyone will be, will be happy with the um, resulting political order. So in diagnosing the generations of democracy, uh, we surely want to keep the subject's perspective central because this is the only way to look into phenomena like uh, withdrawal from, from uh, participation in politics or in voting, but we also want to filter somehow internal stances. And so I guess the, the challenge and my question is how we do so, how we keep together this internal perspective, but also these filters on uh, the internal perspective. Um, and I think this question connects also with my previous one on the role of social movements. Um, so for example, Professor Gaunker invites us um, I quote, not to dismiss the mounting number of riot-like incidents as the irrational eruptive flailing of malcontents, as this doesn't advance our understanding of why today we are facing a veritable global protest tsunami. So I wonder if this warning, together with a re-evaluation of the role of social movements for renewing democracy, shouldn't lead us to rethink the Thalic concept of democracy in a bottom-up way, rather than in a top-down fashion, um, and I wonder whether the invitation to pay attention to the politics of the street, so to both molar and molecular protests, could help us refine the tele concept of democracy in a bottom-up way, which could be a way to keep together the internal perspective of those who are subject to the democratic regime and some sort of normative filter that we want to apply, because we don't want to just reproduce, of course, the, the status quo. My final comment is about whether we can be hopeful about democracies and to what extent. Um, so you ground your diagnosis on democracy as a teleconcept. And in introduction, you write that I quote, democracy itself raises expectations that existing structure cannot, structures cannot meet. And of course, thinking of democracy as a teleconcept has the merit of offering a blueprint of the ideal democracy, which guides us um, also in the political practice. So we know if we want to progress with this concept, we know what's the direction, right? Uh, but I also see two risks in doing so, and I would like to, to hear uh, from you on them. So the first is that since democracy raises expectations that we can never meet, um, I fear that the outcome, at least in the political practice, is not to announce progressive stances, uh, but rather to generate frustration, resignation, and disaffection for democracy. And if so, I see a further risk of ending up supporting the populist project, which many times raises its consensus um, exactly from these uh, feelings of frustration. And the second problem I see regards the relationship between the theory and the political practice and how the former can actually inform and guide the latter. So 
of course, in a non-ideal world where we have to take political decisions also on the basis of feasibility concerns, I wonder what is the role and the scope of influence of democracy as a teleconcept if it is formulated in ideal terms or in top-down terms. So to put it in a slogan, I wonder if the teleconcept of democracy leaves us with less hope about the future of democracy than a less demanding uh, way of, of conceptualizing it. And finally, related to this point, I wonder if our hope in democracies depends exclusively on the health of um, democracies themselves, or also on the fact that in an interconnected world, democracies are in relationship with non-democracies and they sort of like need to absorb the impact, right? So for example, the failure in providing adequate care during co the COVID pandemic is not only due to the economic interests affecting democracies, which is of course a huge part of, of, of what happened, but also to the fact that we had to deal with regimes that were reluctant to provide information. So I was wondering whether a teleconcept of democracy should host also standards that help uh, protect democracies from the generations that in some way are triggered or come from outside democracies themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. And so now we pass it over to Professor Julian Cope. I'll let you introduce yourself, Julian. Um, hello, good evening, everyone, or good afternoon. Um, I'm associate professor in the philosophy program here at, at AUP. I work on democratic education. I'm about to edit a um, handbook on democratic education at uh, Cambridge University Press, and I'm also editing um, the journal Analyse and Critique, which is putting out an um, issue on um, Andreas Beckwitz's Society of Singularities, to which uh, Craig Calhoun is also um, contributing, um, which is a social theorist um, from, from Berlin, Germany, and um, that's going to be an exciting discussion, I think. I may am um, honored and privileged to be part of this um, this this discussion. Um, all three um, of um, the authors of the book have greatly um, influenced my my thinking. It would take too long to go into the details uh, of the various ways in which their their books have uh, contributed to my um, intellectual development. I just want to, to to flag that that has actually been been the case, and so I feel very honored and um, privileged to be able to share some of my thoughts on their. Um, on their book. It's it's a great read. It's interdisciplinary. It speaks to a timely um, problem, um, that of the degeneration of, um, of democracy. I initially planned to discuss chapter four on authenticity and meritocracy in, in particular, but then I found out that they actually didn't have enough criticisms because I agreed too much with their analysis of, of chapter four, which in a nutshell says that the politics of um, identity, even though it was progressive in providing room for um, um, recognition of marginalized groups um, throughout mm -hmm. the modern period, especially since the 1990s, it nevertheless has also undermined um, bonds of community and has therefore also been detrimental to um, democracy and meritocracy, even though it initially set out as a program to, to limiting um, equality by promoting equality of opportunity, it has turned into an ideology which actually legitimizes inequality rather than curbing um, inequality. And since I agree too much, I won't focus on um, these particular um, discussions of chapter four, but rather I want to speak about three um, issues, namely um, a distinction between the, the, the degenerations of democracy versus the degenerations of American democracy in particular, Second, um, the third wave of democratization that Huntington um, discusses versus the third transformation of democracy um, that was discussed in the 80s and 90s by Robert Dahl and David Held. And then third, I want to discuss the moral grammar of democracy, whether the moral grammar of democracy is best expressed as a um, telic concept or that of a um, deontic concept. Okay, so I started with the distinction between degenerations of democracy in general and degenerations of American democracy in particular, um, given that 
um, one central part of the line of argumentation of the book is that there's been an erosion of the social foundations of democracy, um, especially um, economic inequality has tremendously increased. And also um, on the social level, there has been a great deal of uh, fragmentation and polarization. Um, and these social and economic trends have led to um, various forms of um, um, degenerations, uh, lack of citizen efficacy, exclusion and polarization. And I'm wondering to what extent the, the analysis at some points at least may be um, more adequate for the US con uh, context rather than the um, European context. And regarding the analysis of the discrepancy in, in inequality, um, I hope that I can share a slide that I prepared and Zach is trying to, to show that um, regarding the, the development of inequality um, in Europe and the United um, States. So it is the case that over the past four decades, the um, top 1% of the US population has tremendously um, increased its share in the national income. Um, so it has gone up from 10% in the 1980s to over 20% in, um, um, in 2015. Whereas the share of the bottom 50% has gone down from slightly over 20% to um, slightly over 12%. So we here in the room, we can now see that slide. Can those who participate no, online? Because it's been taken off the screen for everybody else. Okay. So Zach, those who are online, they, they don't see it? Online can no, you can't. Okay, no. you know what? All right, I think we need to maybe. Uh, we okay, saw so it I, briefly. So. Okay, so I just idea. I just explained the basic idea. So in the U.S., the top one percent in the nineteen eighties, they used to have ten percent of the national income. Twenty fifteen, they have twenty percent, and the bottom fifty percent, they used to have twenty percent. Now they have ten percent. So um, there was an inverse relationship between the top 1% and the top 50% in the US. In Western Europe, by contrast, the top 1% in the 1980s had around 10%. 2015, they still have roughly around 10%. They now have 12% of the share of national income. Whereas the bottom 50% in Western Europe in the 1980s, they had around 24%. 2015, they still have around 22%. So the top 1% in Europe didn't make a lot of increases. The top 1% uh, in the US made tremendous increases, doubled the, the share, whereas the bottom 50% stayed roughly similar in Western Europe, but has been halved in its proportion of the national income in the, in the US. Um, that suggests that the rise in inequality in the US has been much greater than it has been in, in Western Europe. And to the extent that the analysis laid out in the book mainly relies on the uh, development of economic inequality over the past four decades, this phenomenon may be more um, characteristic of um, US rather than um, Western, Western democracy. If you look at um, sociolo sociologist analysis of um, polarization in, in Europe, and here I'm speaking particularly of, of France and Germany, they, they analyze fragmentation um, but, but not polarization. So, so they, they recognize that society is more fragmented. I'm thinking of analysis by Jérôme Courquet on um, um, the French archipelago, which says that the French society is basically um, um, a multitude of different islands that are connected to one another, um, but they are basically separate from another, but he doesn't speak of a, of a polarization. Likewise, in, um, in Germany, sociologists like um, like Chef Mao, also they recognize the fragmentation of society, but they deny that there is an increase in the polarization of, of society, different from the analysis of sociologists in the, in the US. And this also then seems to suggest that this social polarization, which is a major part of the analysis of, of the book, also seems to apply more directly to the US case rather than Western uh, European case. And so the question is, 
Is it a generation degeneration? Or are these degenerations of democracy um, in the Western sphere as a whole, or is it rather in North America, or is it in you in the U.S. and the U.K., um, or is it perhaps applying mostly or predominantly to the U.S.? So, what is the scope of the social theory um, underlying the, the analysis of of the book? Um, my second point now um, refers to this contrast between the, the third wave of democracy and the third transformation of democracy. The third transformation of democracy was brought up by Robert Dahl in his famous book, Democracy and its, and its Critics, um, in which he says that there was a first transformation of democracy with the emergence of um, um, democracy in Greek city-states like, like Athens. You have a second transformation of democracy with the emergence of national democracies through the invention of the idea of representation. And then he says, towards the end of the 20th century, there's a third transformation of democracy given transnationalization and globalization, which leads to an asymmetry between rule givers and rule takers, and which will be consequential for the future of, um, of democracy, especially in the early, early 21st century. This, this third transformation of democracy is, is not widely um, discussed in, in the book, rather um, this phase at the end of the 20th century is mainly interpreted to the lens of the third wave of globalization from Huntington, which says that um, the new formation of democracies in Southern Europe, South America, um, and Eastern Europe has led to this um, euphoria, euphoria this, this groundfulism of the idea of democracies uh, continuous um, spread and because of this um, belief in democracy's expansion, um, people didn't see the problems that were coming, didn't see the degenerations that have been already taking place throughout the 80s and 90s and which have unraveled um, in the past decade. Um, this analysis however, seems to neglect, I think, that democratic theorists, major democratic theorists like Dahl and um, and also David Held have pointed to this problem of the third transformation, the problem of, of globalization, the way in which it puts into question whether the nation state itself can remain at the center of democratic thought, or as Robert Dahl has put it, quote, the danger is that the third transformation will lead not to an extension of the democratic idea beyond the nation state, but to the victory in that domain of de facto guardianship, end of quote. So Dahl um, and and also held were very much aware of the problems um, brought about to globalization. And I'm bringing this up because it seems crucial for understanding as to why um, um, economic inequality and also neoliberalism has spiraled out of control in the 70s and 80s to the extent that the organized capitalism, the welfare state capitalism within a Westphalian order was no longer maintainable um, in a globalized world in which the financial actors, the economic actors could always decide to escape regulation by moving to um, another country, by just going elsewhere, thereby following out, undermining the effectiveness of um, the regulation of the state. And this, I believe, is a very important analytical element in understanding the degenerations of democracy to the extent that if it is the case that nation states are not effective because of this escape from state regulation, then the solution or one approach to uh, rebuilding democracy would have to reside in more international cooperation, more transnational cooperation for the sake of harmonizing, coordinating the regulation of economic actors, of environmental problems at the structural or international levels, because otherwise, all attempts to, to tame global, uh, sorry, to, to tame um, the economic actors, all attempts to um, re embed the um, markets that have been disembedded throughout the 80s and 90s, they will fail unless this um, problem of escape from state regulation is somehow solved at the um, inter or transnational level, which may also mean that solidarity might have to transcend the local, regional, and national context, which is the main focus of the book, Generations of um, Democracy. I understand that 
um, Nations Matter, as Greg Polhner famously put it in the title of his, of his book. Nevertheless, I think that beyond the recognition of the importance of nations there should be a wider consideration of um, cosmopolitan or transnational forms of solidarity for the sake of preserving national um, democracies. Okay, that was my, my second point, the third wave of democratization versus the um, third transformation of democracy. My final point is the moral grammar of democracy. Is it a deontic concept or is it a, a telic concept? Charles Taylor defines it in um, the first chapter on page 19 as a telic project where he says, democracy would be a truly equal society. Democracy is a telic concept, necessarily a matter of purposes and ideals, not merely conditions or causal relations. It's defined by standards that can never be met. This is a concept of what the ideal should be, what democracy should integrally realize, end of quote. By contrast, I would like to lay out an idea of um, democracy as a deontic concept, where the idea of a deontic concept is that the point of democracy is to avoid injustice. The point of democracy is to protect the dignity of human beings who want to see that the institutions under which they lead and under, under which they live, the policies under which they uh, have to lead their lives can be justifiable to them. And institutions have to be reformed, practices have to be reformed to the extent that they cannot see themselves as authors of the rules to which they are subject to. And once you reach a point in which um, institutions dominate individuals, dominate agents, be viewed as, as um, a form of injustice. And the point of democracy then is to um, rectify the injustice. It's um, the idea of overcoming that, that injustice rather than bringing about some particular value um, which may be associated with the idea of um, um, egalitarian society. I think the deontic and the telic vision of democracy, they can be combined to the extent that we might say we have to overcome political domination and establish basic fundamental forms of democracy that realize everyone's right to be respected as um, a source of normative authority, as Rawls um, would have put it. And once we have this basic form of democracy, then people can decide which values they want to pursue and engage in this more telic moment of pursuing particular ideals and, and purposes. If we look at the, the history of democracy, the democratic revolutions of the 18th century, or also if we look at um, what has happened in the 80s and 90s, when there was this breakdown of the um, tamed class struggles and inequality has spiraled out of control. If we ask how to analyze these phenomena from a normative point of view, I think that the deontic perspective is a very valuable one to the extent that um, the concerns of the democratic group revolutionaries were those of avoiding domination, didn't want to be dominated by the aristocracy, they didn't want to be dominated by the British colonialists in the case of the 18th century revolutions, or if you think of the neoliberal inequality that has taken shape over the past few decades, it seems plausible to say that the problem of this inequality is this form of domination. It's an injustice that results from economic inequality. And as such, it's um, something that must be overcome as a matter of justice and as a matter of dignity, rather as something that should be achieved for the um, sake of realizing some, some value. OK, so that was my, my third point on the moral grammar of democracy, which is a more philosophical concern. I, concede, but um, that's the head that I have on here today. And so I want to share this point with you as well. Thanks very much for your attention. And now we turn to Stephen Sawyer. Okay. Um, so uh, just briefly to introduce myself, I'm the director of the Center for Critical Democracy Studies here at AUP, professor of history, involved in a multi-volume history of the demos. The first volume appeared in 2018 under the title Demos Assembled, focusing on the period 1840 to 1880, and I'm currently finishing the second on the first half of the 19th century. Um, 
let me just say it is a great honor uh, uh, to be in conversation with the, the three of you. And uh, as Julian so elegantly stated, it would take more than the all of the time we have here this evening to explain how uh, your work has shaped my own and, and with this book continues to do so. Uh, but thank you for uh, agreeing to, to join us uh, today. So on page 209, the, the book, uh, the, the authors uh, boldly state, we need history to understand our present predicament. Uh, I took this as an invitation as a historian of democracy to think with you in your book about how a historical prism might shape our contemporary democratic, our understanding of the contemporary democratic crisis. The imperative of history seems to be a direct consequence of a central thesis of the book, that is that democracy is not degenerating due to attacks from the outside, uh, that is the usual suspects of populism, neoliberalism, and social media may not have helped, but they are not the essential culprits. This approach, on the other hand, uh, argues that democracy is degenerating from within, and it suggests that this is happening through a double movement. First, this is a book of democratic theory and democratic diagnosis that moves away from the idea that there is some overarching threat of totalitarianism, either as endemic to democracy, as so many liberals have suggested, or as a constant threat from would-be dictators waiting in the wings who must be consistently conjured away through the high walls of elite epistemic governance. In short, I do not read this as an anti-totalitarian critique of our democratic crisis. Second, to understand these degenerative tendencies within democracy, the book combines a history, a theory, and a diagnosis of democracy present crisis. All three are intimately bound in this volume, and I must say that I find this kind of imbricated approach to democracy to be extremely rewarding once again uh, from these authors. And when it is combined with the interdisciplinarity and extraordinary scholarly foundation of these authors, it makes for an exhilarating read. For my part, I guess what I'd like to do in these brief comments is pull on some of the historical threads, if you will, and draw out some of the consequences of this history. And I'd like to do so by briefly discussing two historical moments that loom largest in the book, sort of that appear in a number of chapters throughout the book. One is the revolutionary period, which let's broadly define it as uh, sort of 1770 into the first part of the 19th century, uh, first third of the 19th century. And then the second is the New Deal. Um, now, in chapter one for the revolutionary era, it is presented as a moment when democracy is something of, as the French would say, a gros mot. It is argued that there is a shift from democracy as something that the founders of the American Constitution did not want, that is a pejorative term, to its quickly being accepted in the 19th century. The claim in, this, in the first chapter by Charles Taylor is that this sudden historical shift leaves a legacy. And this legacy is an ambiguity inherent in democracy. That is an ambiguity that is in fact inherent in the term demos. On the one hand, a government for the whole population as either a people or a nation. And on the other, the demos as the non-elites or the populace, if you will. Democracy means both, even as they are in tension. And out of this ambiguity, I understand Charles Taylor to be arguing that democracy emerges as a teleconcept largely because of this historical ambiguity. In chapter two, Craig Calhoun builds on this idea to highlight the role of republicanism in the American Revolution, arguing that the Republican regime was, in, uh, was designed to balance democracy in a mixed constitution. He further recognizes that this republicanism has been at once crucial and problematic. What has been problematic is the elitism which Republican constitutions use to stabilize democracy at the same time that the Republican regime has been crucial to providing the kind of stability to overcome 
the Constitution's very limitations. I read this as part of what Craig Calhoun refers to as contradictions and double movements, the consistent process of exclusion, elitism, and capture that has at the same time been followed by periods of democratic expansion, degeneration, and renewal, as he refers to it. A second historical moment that is highlighted in the book is the New Deal, which as the book suggests was a project to save democracy, that's a quote. It is argued that the New Deal was democratic for at least three reasons. There, there, I, I brought these sort of together, but there are other reasons in, in the book. But the first um, to highlight would be that it is because it was a moment when the series of popular movements led by progressives and labor, the direct action that Philip Gonkar emphasizes coalesced into a larger and more universal political solution. Second, because it focused not simply on legislation, but on building a better, more, better because more egalitarian society. And third, because it was piecemeal and iterative without a predetermined plan. I find these arguments very convincing and again was captivated by the way they bring together history, theory, and a diagnosis of the present crisis. And in some ways, I found myself in the same situation as Julian agreeing and wondering how I would, um, how I would uh, re respond to this to stimulate some conversation. Now, what I'd like to do is draw on some of the historical work that has, uh, some of the other historical work that has shaped my readings of the demos. And so, and so I'll just very briefly summarize that and then use those to, to, to pose a few sort of questions or to think, try to think with you on, on some of the consequences of this history. The first point is that there has been work uh, that, that demonstrates that in the, revolution, the revolutionary era and even into the early 19th century, democracy was not necessarily always a pejorative term. There are certainly many who make that claim, but it was not necessarily always the case. We have figures like the Marquis d'Argenson in the mid 18th century. We also have, uh, for example, letter eight from the Letters of the Mountain by Rousseau. Uh, we have some uh, recent work on James Wilson uh, and a number of great figures, a number of figures engaged in the French Revolution for whom democracy had a positive connotation. Now, what was this positive connotation? In short, for those who were in favor of democracy in this period, it was not associated with popular sovereignty. It was associated with popular government. And this distinction that we've learned so much about um, through a number of authors, but perhaps first and foremost by Richard Tuck most recently, this sovereignty government distinction played out in very important ways in the particular equation of democracy. In the case of France in the old regime, the king was sovereign with all sovereign powers, including the right to make law. So in the old regime, it was a question of what kind of government would execute this sovereign will. Democracy referred to the form of government in which the people exercise the sovereign will as opposed to aristocratic government or monarchical government. Now, moderates during the French Revolution argued that once you have popular sovereignty, as you did as of 1789, then the possibility of democratic government is, becomes, it becomes very problematic. So under royal sovereignty, you could have democratic government, but under popular sovereignty, you're going to need something else, uh, the moderates argue, and that is some version of aristocratic government, which will become representative, what we will call representative government. The political radicals are arguing that a popular sovereign may only be properly governed democratically and therefore must choose a democratic government. And in some ways, this, the, the argument has been that this is sort of what's at stake in the French Revolution. In the first half of the 19th century, just to conclude this, there is a third way of defining democracy that is added. So we have democracy as sovereignty, we have democracy as government, and then there is this term that sits at the heart of Tocqueville's work, but he's certainly not the only one to use it, which is democratic society, or democracy is a mode of social organization, which in many ways entirely bypasses the problem of democratic sovereignty. And yet the problem of reigns, must a democratic society govern itself democratically? And one could also sort of divide the left and the right in the first half of the 19th century along the lines of whether they say, yes, it should, or no, it shouldn't. The right arguing 
some new form of aristocracy is necessary, and the left broadly arguing that a democratic society must govern itself democratically, and Tocqueville sort of sitting in the middle there. Um, very briefly for the New Deal, I'm, I'm thinking of William Novak's uh, most recent book called The New Democracy, which concludes with a chapter entitled The Myth of the New Deal State. He claims that in fact, the whole series of technologies that developed and culminated in the New Deal were actually being constructed from the close of the Civil War, and in particular, following the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments through the invention of a new form of national citizenship, and then a more pragmatic and realist constitutionalism, and overall, a scaling up of the regulatory powers that had existed at the level, at the local level in antebellum US. He argues for what Pierre Rosanvalon has referred to as a culture of generality in the process of state making as essential to creating a whole range of scaled up technologies for, um, for administrative power. Now, uh, I know we're not here to sort out historical details. Uh, what I would like to do is sort of suggest some of the ways that, uh, that these, uh, these readings may, or some questions that, uh, that they pose and that I'd like to take the opportunity to ask you. The first is on the relationship between democratic society and democratic government. Um, that I, one can read throughout the entire book. It, it, it may not be posed in precisely those terms, but I, I sort of was able to follow that thread throughout the entire book, and perhaps especially present in chapters two through four. Uh, chapters two and three, privileged capitalism is the perspective through which to understand the double movement of degeneration renewal. This is obviously essential. But the book also cites Tuckville throughout, the, uh, throughout as one resource for thinking about democratic crisis and renewal. I'd like to highlight a slightly different part of Tuckville tied to the notion of democratic society. There is also in his story a primacy of democracy over capitalism. That is, he sees many of the challenges to modern society emerging out of its democratization, that is the equality of condition that is inherent in democratic society. Capitalism then emerges within this democratization of society and is able to gather such a hold in the modern age precisely because democratic society is relatively weak in resisting its deleterious effects, unlike aristocratic society, which he thinks is actually quite good at uh, cabining off aristocratic, um, uh, aristocratic society, which is quite good at uh, preventing capitalist society from, uh, or ca capitalism from its, uh, from, from uh, developing its sort of abuses. He therefore argues that what is necessary is a variety of modes of democratic government that will prevent the destructive forces of capitalism from destroying democratic society from within. And I'm just wondering how you might respond to the Tocquevillian challenge of the relationship between democratic society and democratic government. One could argue that the social movements and transformations of the last 50 years have been spawned by an unprecedented critique of racial, gender, and sexual privilege. In a Tocquevillian analysis, it is precisely by manipulating this new condition of equality that a new capitalism has taken hold. Tocqueville's response was to argue that a democratic society needed to govern itself democratically, and I wonder how closely this resonates with your position. Second, I'd like to ask about the Republican solution that underscores some arguments throughout the book. One of the common themes throughout the book is that a Republican ideal of solidarity and civic virtue may help overcome contemporary generations of democracy. This is very convincing. It has been in, in, in your work for, for a long time. Um, I'm wondering about this, and this comes back to the, to some extent what, what Julian was saying, from a European perspective. Now, it seems to me that the advantage of democracy um, is, as discussed above, and, and, and some of you have discussed this in other places in your work, that is that it is a form of government and a modern social movement toward relative equality of condition. And as such, it has the advantage of being relatively agnostic about the scale at which public problems are posed. As Dewey, who was uh, discussed in the book, highlights in his public and its problems, the cornerstone of a democratic state is solving public problems at the relevant scale, not predetermining the scale at which public problems must be solved. 
This is particularly helpful for Europe and has been essential as Dewey highlighted to the US, especially in the wake of the Civil War, when the great process of scaling up uh, of, of administrative powers took place. It would seem to me, but I'd like to hear your thoughts if, you're, if this is at all interesting to you, that, Republican, that the Republican solution in the contemporary European context faces some weaknesses, uh, as opposed to this sort of multi-scalar democratic approach. First, since the Republican tradition places the Respublica first, it seems to me, at least certainly in the account of Pocock that is referenced in the, in, in the book, that it has always been relatively agnostic about the role of aristocracy. Um, and indeed, um, the classical republics of Florence, Venice, and England were deeply attached to notions of aristocracy. And yet, somehow this seems more problematic in an age when privilege is so much at the core uh, of, of contemporary social movements, that is denouncing privilege. Second, since republicanism is built, as you demonstrate, on a relatively strong notion of solidarity and virtue, it, it, seems that it, it would seem that it cannot afford to be agnostic about scale. In other words, the boundary problem of where the republic starts and stops seems particularly acute. It would seem, however, that while Europe may be very effective in enrolling the people in solving public problems at a variety of scales, calls for the EU to be a republic seem challenging to me. So I, I, I'd like to hear um, uh, thoughts that you might have on that. Finally, very briefly, highlight the place in popular movements in constructing lasting institutional solutions. I thought the chapter on direct action was um, uh, just echoed so uh, so clearly with what uh, with uh, what I've been discovering for the first half of the 19th century in Europe. Um, now, it is commonly argued that the transformations brought on by neoliberal capitalism, social media, and populism are ushering in a new age. You disagree with this statement, and specifically, Gunkar demonstrates the importance of both molecular and molar social movements in the attempts to reverse de democratic degeneration. It seems to me that emphasizing the period 1770 to 1848, which Charles Tilley and others have underscored as a high point of political contestation in global history, um, as a moment when the term, also as the moment when democracy came into its contemporary meaning um, and sets the stage for Huntington's first wave, it seems to me that this is sort of important, that you have this uh, popular, this sort of high point of popular movements and the emergence of the word democracy or our contemporary definitions of it coming together at the same time. Now, I guess the question is, I'm just wondering as I read this, do you understand this current moment of degeneration to be a moment in which we are facing a transition of similar scope? That is that we may be inventing new practices and profoundly new notions of democracy along the what we were, what was happening between 1770 and let's say 1848, or do you see us as still being a part of that paradigm uh, that emerged at that point, and in some ways needing uh, uh, to to sort of better understand that period in order to understand our own? I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Great. Um, before we get to to your comments, since no one really talked about media and communication. Um, here, I, and it's more my uh, area, I'd like to just make just a couple of brief comments, maybe two to three minutes, okay? Um, pertaining especially to Delip's focus on making the demos safe for democracy and taming the demos, but actually running through the entire book, I think, in terms of inclusivity and efficacy uh, and polarization as well, we might reemphasize the way communication and media infrastructures, in a nod to Polanyi, maybe, Polanyi, are embedded in a new form of capitalism. And thus so is potential democratic deliberation and discourse, but also how it is embedded in a kind of democrophobia of the late 19th century liberalism forward. And Lip touches on that. Uh, in the what is to be done chapter where you talk most about, about media and communication, uh, firms like Cambridge Analytic are mentioned but not really as something that has been building historically in the post-World War I liberal democracy, despite variations and corresponding to new communication technologies and practices. Um, certainly one might find the objection reminiscent 
the Socrates regarding the Sophists and the Gorgias. But as these authors concede, you all, uh, there is something palpably sinister about the means with which it is conducted today. Nonetheless, the stress is placed on communication technologies and other developments since the 1970s. And then almost exclusively the social media companies today. While there may be a deeper and more constant anti-democratic relationship between all these, um, Delip focuses on this democrophobia and taming the demos, but not these relationships that I'm talking about here, right? I'm, I would argue that they also have been have contributed a great deal to the massive measured distrust people have towards politics and democracy, news media, and pretty much everything else today. Since the 1920s in the US, now fairly globalized, an influence industry has developed at elites higher to manage perception, emotional engagement, participation generally in competition to set agendas and form public opinion. This dates to the experimental knowledge uh, in the modern period from the Creel Committee in World War I on those who learned from that experimentation and brought it into so-called peacetime, like Edward Bernays' post-war experiments in the production of so-called pseudo-events, as Borston called them, right? Through Bush's Carl Rove, Steve Bannon, and the Washington K Street firms that are hired around the globe to intervene in elections and crucial issue and image management, political consulting, marketing, and PR, it's now even moved into neuromarketing and data analytics for, as you mentioned, and as you mentioned, micro-targeting. These are highly asymmetrical resources that elites employ versus the demos uh, in managing or even trying to program efficacy and polarization too. Further looking at the work like Bernays propaganda, Littman's public opinion, and recent histories of political marketing and consulting like um, Adam Scheingate's uh, Making Politics a Business, or Dennis Johnson's on um, the history of political marketing in the United States. If you look at that from the historical perspective, one wonders to what degree this harnessing of communication and media to make the demos safe for elites is embedded in liberal democracy itself, in rep its represent mass representative forms, where anxieties by elites pass from one type of elite to another, Right? And here we might think of work like Kagan's um, aristocratic liberalism. It may be, finally, that the resource-rich professional political communication that avails itself of data analytics and applied cognitive science doesn't just try to apply perception, but to try to set the standards for the form and style of political discourse itself, the incivility that you do recognize. Right? Don't we have to ask as in thinking about 20th and 21st century representative democracy, why do we even have these influence industries at all? And what might they have to do with the history of liberal democracy? Now I turn it over to, to you all to, to make your comments as you would like in the fashion that you would like, okay? Okay, um, I've been tapped by the lip, uh, who often is the one who actually gets the three of us organized, um, to speak first. And let me speak first by saying thank you. Um, thank you uh, to Jason um, and, AAU, and AUP. Um, thanks to Ilaria, to Stephen, to Julian. These are really rich comments. They are gracious and generous, but also challenging. Um, and I'm going to guess that we don't have all of the detailed answers we would like to have to all of the challenges, um, but we'll try to take the conversation forward. We agreed that we would each pick up um, one or two themes in initial comments and try to keep those brief and then proceed conversationally to see um, if we can um, get back to many of the other themes, uh, depending on uh, how we took notes. Um, I'm going to guess there were somewhere between seven and 19 of these themes, so we won't get back to all of them, and uh, we apologize. Now, um, I'm going to begin um, mainly by responding to uh, uh, Stephen Sawyer um, on the theme of scale, but I want to link that uh, Back to um, to Julian Culp on inequality um, and to Ilaria's early comments, um, even though they weren't directed to chapters of which I was a primary protagonist, um, on populism, democracy, and republicanism. So um, let me uh, 
go first to um, to Ilaria's comment and uh, and just say I'm of the three of us perhaps the most um, sympathetic to populism, but it depends on what you call populism. And I think we all three agree that this is a contested term with no stable meaning that isn't pejorative to um, some other meanings and ways in which people think of themselves. Um, but um, one of the senses of populism for me has to do with establishing the notion of the people itself a contested concept and thus the potential demos of democracy. So it can't be evaded. Populists aren't coming from somewhere else completely um, out of the picture into the picture with a protest. There is a problem for democracy always of giving um, an adequate account of the people and um, dealing with calls to expand or change the notion of the people. Um, and so populists become entrance into this. This doesn't mean that there aren't um, uh, issues and challenges, but that, that there isn't a clear and simple meaning to the people against which to contrast um, this alleged distortion. And um, moreover, um, it's feasible to look at lots of movements to expand who is seen as the people um, as populist movements of earlier eras. Um, and that puts in some different perspective the ones of our current era. I think where we, and especially I, want to come down on this um, then has to do with, with taking these movements seriously, refusing to identify populism entirely with current versions of right-wing action, um, insisting that there are left populists, including in the current world, that there are movements. The one, for example, that gave us the term populism, the 1890s um, US populists um, of the Farmers Alliance and some trade union activists um, should not be ignored in order to name as populists, a variety of later actors on the right or to link them exclusively to fascism. Um, but this then raises the anxiety about democracy question because it seems to me, and this is more linked to what I want to say about scale and, and Stephen's comment. I don't think we are arguing for republicanism against democracy. Um, and I don't think we even believe that the founders entirely were arguing for republicanism against democracy. They were arguing about democracy, how much could be absorbed in what way um, in a republican framework. And that's significant in terms of at least my um, view of the current challenges, because I think what's often at stake is short circuiting republicanism in the name of democracy. It is populist groups who, exactly as you and others have said, understand themselves to be Democrats, even the real Democrats, demanding true democracy, but who are willing to um, um, ignore or devalue a lot of the Republican arrangements that have put into place. And in that respect, many of the guarantees for various kinds of liberties, of, of freedoms, um, of minority views and so forth are um, Republican rather than Democratic. And so the issue is how to not have democracy ride roughshod over the protections of religious freedom, um, ethnic diversity, um, and so forth um, in a majoritarian fashion. Um, link that to inequality quickly and just say, um, I think Julia makes a variety of really good points. Um, I just want to pick up the, is this about America rather than Europe, um, and say not entirely. Um, I think that um, it is true that we are more influenced by the American case, and it is true that the American case is more extreme on the issue of inequality. Um, and uh, the chart he puts up um, illustrates that. But this is a really complex um, area to enter into that we won't deal with adequately today. And so let me just, um, first give the punchline and then a couple of qualifications. The punchline I would say is, at least in my view, I think our view, these are challenges everywhere, including in Europe. Um, so it, 
it would be um, a mistake for Europeans to think, oh, thank goodness we don't have these inequality problems, they're just American. Um, first off, as Thomas Piketty has argued, they may be even more non-Western and third world problems. Um, second, there is a particular pattern um, captured by the top 1%, or even as Gabriel Zuckman puts it, the top one-tenth of 1% of a huge amount of wealth in America. Um, and uh, um, so America is extreme, but uh, Piketty and Paris School of Economics colleagues, Thomas Blanchet and so forth, have um, brought out very clearly that the European pattern is of more success taming equality and some recent erosion of that prior success so that the direction of travel in Europe is not necessarily towards greater equality moving farther away from the American disaster, but in part um, being caught up in some of the similar um, productions of inequality and erosion of state moderation um, of inequality, albeit not as extreme. Um, if we were going to go further into this, and I really don't want to, I'd say we have to look at growth rates as well and what growth weights do to thinking about um, inequality, because inequality in a relatively stagnant um, system looks different from inequality with growth. There are a lot of other things going on in all of this. But more salient for this discussion is our desire to put on the table something that I think is similar in pattern. Um, if not in degree um, around the world. And this is the organization of inequality, not just in average terms for whole countries or regions. Um, the European total that you put up in the chart is already slightly, um, uh, not misleading, but is an average, right? An average helped by France and hurt by several other European countries. Right. So, so European countries have not just been European in reducing inequality, they have been nationally varied. It's one of the ways in which national governments continue to matter and policies continue to matter. Um, and everywhere saw inequality going up in Piketty's basic data, um, except France, where it did not, at least beyond standard deviation. Um, and everywhere has seen asymmetry and polarization in varying degrees. And one of the patterns of this is the break between metropolitan areas and non-metropolitan areas in countries. You can say urban and rural, but it's not really just about the rural. Um, but um, even in France, the extent to which experienced um, inequality and asymmetry, to go back to um, Ilaria's emphasis on subjectivities as well as objective factors, um, produces a resentment of Paris and two or three other big cities and their gains on behalf of um, a larger France. This is often seen in terms of a left-right dichotomy, but in fact, there are important parts of the left that have been um, making similar kinds of analyses, not just in relation to the recent elections, but back to José Bové and, and a variety of sorts of of counts. The, um, so the organization of inequality spatially is something that has similarities across many countries. And now this gets back to some of the issues of scale. Stephen really helpfully puts on the table. And I actually also want to call out his own um, work on, um, I failed to write down the name, Demos Assembled, if I remember rightly, um, and thinking about um, what it means to have a magistral view of the people, that is the people taking action um, and um, um, judging and organizing affairs. Um, he brings this up, um, not in terms of his own work today, but in terms of Tocqueville and others, but I think it's a really important perspective here. That is, democracy is not only in questions of national sovereignty um, and not only in questions of, of representation election, direct democracy could be pursued very differently. Um, I want to make two comments about this in closing. Um, one, I'm there's lots to this that could be put under the heading, democracy is important, but not the whole story. Um, that, that is that no matter where you're looking, what you see is democracy and some other things going on. 
capitalism, um, expansions of scale, uh, Republican institutions, and so forth. And I think that we can't really solve the questions um, that we want by imagining democracy isolated from all of these things. So I'm going to interpret Stephen's comments as a call to understand democracy in relation to these. Now, with that in mind, one of the challenges to a very decentralized bottom-up um, thinking of democracy, which I'm in many ways sympathetic to, is dealing with large-scale capitalism and other global factors in this. Um, and so um, those can't be wished away. I think even Tocqueville's really important look at democracy as a form of social organization um, essentially egalitarian, um, rather than just a political system, as powerful as that is, doesn't have within Tocqueville a strong account of cop capitalism. It has a couple of insights, um, which Stephen pointed to, about why democracy is potentially vulnerable to some of the problems of capitalism, what democracy might offer, even what structures of intermediate associations, the sort of Montesquieuian moment might offer. But there isn't really a Tocquevillian theory of capitalism. Um, and capitalism is a big part of the story, creating large scale. That's not just an option like, oh, we could live. Um, in communities of 6,000 each. Um, it is a way in which the world is organized that democracy has to contend with. And so one can try to imagine how to democratize global capitalism. One can try to demand and how to break it or transcend it. But one also can imagine what gives democracy some capacity to deal with it, which is one of the reasons I've argued that democracy needs to be um, multi-scalar in Stephen's phrase, but it needs to include the national scale sometimes regional scales like Europe, sublocal, but not just the local, um, that these are all part of a common story there um, where a both and or multi-scalar approach is questionable. I don't think that means being agnostic in the Deweyan sense that Stephen cites, but it does mean being flexible and it does mean being open to potential contention about where at what scale problems are going to be addressed and solved um, if there's not um, a single answer to all of this. Um, and uh, in closing on that, um, I feel obliged to come back to Stephen's big question. I don't have a great answer to it. Are we on the verge of a new epic? Um, what's happening here? Um, I think my main comment is how I see uh, Charles's notion of the TLIC concept, which is not that there is a blueprint for the future that stays the same, but that we are always necessarily looking to futures and to trying to make things better. So what we understand normatively as the direction of progress shifts and gets adjusted, can be expanded, can be rethought, and that's part of what democracy does. And we've been inventing the new repeatedly. So yes, late 18th and early 19th century is pivotal, but late 19th and early 20th centuries were not just an era of consolidation. Um, and in other parts of your comments referring to sort of the myth of the New Deal, you see that indeed there's lots of innovation and novelty, that social movements are bringing changes. Lots of what will get pulled together in the New Deal is um, organized. Um, out of the products of social movements, of experiments at state levels in the United States, and a variety of other sources. Um, so the new is getting invented recurrently, um, sometimes getting squashed and leaving only traces for later recovery. Um, but um, are we in an era where there are potential resources for a resumption of democracy? Um, I want to say yes. I don't want to say, don't worry, it's happening. I want to say, worry, it's not happening nearly enough. There are big opposing forces, but there are resources and there are um, comrades in the effort to um, create more of this. But I think we aren't, we three, united in exactly how optimistic we are. So um, let me, with that, close my comments and turn over uh, to um, uh, the three, to, to my colleagues, proceeding in the order of our co-authorship. So, Dilip next. Dilip, you're muted. <laughs> 
I thought Charles will go next because that's what I indicated to Jason. But Charles, are you okay going next or you want me to go? I, I don't mind either then. way. Go, go ahead, Charles. Yeah. Go ahead, Chuck, then. Okay, fine. So, well, I repeat what uh, Craig said. I mean, there's a wonderful set of issues that have been raised and so rich and deep when you can't really get at all of them. So rather than going through the three uh, critics in order, I'm going to pick up some things that I think are very important and have, need to be addressed, which straddled the, the, three, um, the, the three critiques. And I think that one of the most important things to pick up on today is <clears throat> opacity, that from time to time, the workings of a democratic society become more and more opaque to its uh, participants. That is the, uh, the sense of what could cause what, who to vote for in order to get what result, what kind of movement to support in order to move forward once what one thinks is important becomes more and more thick. I mean, more and more, the, 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 the uh, atmosphere of vision becomes more and more uh, uh, foggy. And I think that's what we have so let's look at the United States, and I have to say, for the I want to hold the issue of whether we're talking really entirely about mostly about the U.S. and Trump, or something more general. I think it is more general, but let's look at the U.S. from this point of view. You get a growing opacity between that era of the New Deal and immediate post-war period, when a lot of people realize that in order to get uh, or maintain a welfare state, in order to have a decent uh, possible deal in their work life. They needed, for instance, trade unions and, <clears throat> and so on. And uh, a lot of the, the notion of what to support, who to support, if, to get the result one wanted was fairly, fairly, uh, fairly clear, fairly powerful. To the Trump situation, where plainly there was an immense amount of opacity which allowed a lot of people to vote for him. Like, you know, as people say, uh, chickens voting for, for uh, what's his name, Colonel Sanders. I mean, the, the first two things Trump did when he was in power was had this incredibly regressive tax reform to get directly against the interests of the majority of his voters. And the second thing was to try to uh, destroy Obamacare, which would also have been, but by that time, enough people had had Obamacare to see that this was not a good thing for them and that foundered, but that there was still tremendous opacity in the US. Now, why is that so? We have to think about this. And this is, we dealt with in various parts of the book, but plainly there are what uh, it sounds like more obscure, but it's the uh, intermediate associations like trade unions are tremendously important, like political parties that actually locally meet and, and discuss there, what what to do, and so on, in which therefore the, the person isolated in his or her home, uh, sitting in the Midwest and a crumbling uh, Rust Belt, right, has some idea because they belong to organizations which talk about this and which lobby for various things. And now, in order to, we have to reconstruct these uh, in, the instruments, and that's exactly on the line of what. Uh, of what Craig just said, that it's always a different situation. So we're always dealing with innovation. Uh, the reconstruction, for instance, in the US of the trade union movement would probably not be mainly on the basis of sites of, of employment, which is what it was before, but something that transcends those differences and brings people together, including people in the gig economy. The, the, the task of making things less opaque would also be very much furthered if we picked up on local kinds of organization in which in which animateur are very good at bringing about in which you get together people, local people from different leaderships in the community and begin to talk over what do we need, what kinds of employment do we need to have, opportunities do we need to have, and so on. So we're talking about great innovation, but we need innovation in order to restore uh, transparency, but not transparency in the in the narrow sense of you know getting information over the government. I mean, making the system and the power system in which one lives transparent, so that one knows who to vote for or who to what to support or what uh, measures to put forward. 
now that this is, um, I mean, this pushes me further to uh, make the point, I think, which the contrary, which we made by Larry and, and also by Julian, are, are we not just talking about an American problem, it's just these crazy Americans who have this, you know, the maniac Trump and so on. Well, no, a lot of these things are happening in different forms. I mean, if you think, for instance, of one of the most important forms of recreating inequality and recreating an impossible situation for people, passes through not which individuals get jobs, well, that's very important, but it passes through also which centers are living and which centers are growing. And in all these Western societies, you get, I mean, to a greater or lesser degree, but you get the growth of certain areas which concentrate more and more people and activities in them and the relative decline of certain other areas. And this is not only true in the US, this is true in the UK. I mean, the, the decline of the Northwest of Leeds in those places is a, has a lot to do with those people ending up voting for um, uh, Brexit and then ending up voting for Boris even in the last in the last election. And the same can be said about Germany. It's, it's perhaps to less degree true about, about France. So um, there again, there is this issue of a this cause of our present situation of an increase in inequality in a world of different form of the vitality of life in these different communities and the possibility of you know having a good job and giving uh, good support to your children uh, decreases but again along with a great deal of opacity which has meant that the dissatisfaction around this has been channeled by um the kind of uh well the forces which touch these issues of identity in a way which as it were channels the energy elsewhere and so so you get the phenomenon of the decline of the northwest uh, in the uk helping along the the, uh, the path of exit now the third thing i like to talk about here and this comes back to Hilaria's questions about different kinds of conflict, that, um, well, I would say to her that, of course, it's not a matter of whether conflict is good or bad. It's a, there is going to be conflict. The, the, there is a well-founded conflict because there are really diff, real differences of interest. But the problem of a healthy democracy is that those conflicts are fought out in the real terms and the terms of what is really harm, harming people, making their lives less rich and the things you could do to change that and the, and the fight over that. What we have here is a slide of conflict into the shadow world of imaginary uh, imaginary threats. And, which, and that is the whole issue of, of opacity. But <clears throat> also, it's clear that uh, this kind of uh, uh, this kind of issue is really fairly widespread, and the type of conflict that it leads to is unresolved conflict. See? So the issue of whether we should put more money into a certain region in order to create jobs is an issue which we can fight over. But it doesn't touch necessarily the very uh, basic identity, political identity of the society, which I, I and I but very much follow Craig here, I believe is absolutely essential because democracy requires some kind of solidarity. Whereas what, what we're seeing now is fights over irreconcilable uh, de definitions of the political identity. And this is partly because the last decades have seen this tremendous push towards overcoming historical inequality of men over women, white over black, settler over, over indigenous and so on. And that has produced a backlash, an identity backlash of people who are deeply discomforted by this, right? So we have here um, a very, very deep problem because we're dealing with two incompatible notions of the political identity. What are considered by one view, one view of the identity, absolutely fundamental values, 
of equality, non-discrimination, and so on, are dressed up by the another very important part of the population as betrayals of conservative or traditional or what have you um, uh, values, which really mask a inability to, or in, in lack of willingness to recognize these discriminations for what they are. Neither side can envisage saying, well, it's just a little bit of discrimination, a little bit, a little bit less than the now, but, uh, you know, we'll give you some of this, nor can the other side envisage uh, facing the fact that there are these issues of discrimination which need to be. So that is a really, really deep, uh, deep problem. And the the answer to it is involved in all the things we were discussing towards the end of the book. I think I probably run uh, out of time. And yes, I'll hand over to the I hope we haven't, I haven't run the clock totally out. Okay. Um, you know, I want to address two questions. In fact, I'll pick up where Charles left off. Uh, is about conflict is the issue raised by Ilaria. In a way, of course, I agree that it's not a question about good or bad conflict, but the point is to distinguish between social conflict and political conflict. That is, there is social conflict irrespective of which society we're talking about. And very often the social conflict has a lot to do with economic inequality, class differences. To that extent, I'm a sort of a lefty on that point. Of course, in modern society, modern political communities, it is also complicated by various other kinds of conflicts of race, gender, religion, and so on and so forth. So as a result, people say, as a result, this whole distinction between it, the economy is stupid as opposed to the culture is stupid when people try to talk about the, the conflict. But I think it is, you know, in some way, fundamentally, a economic conflict, which is also complicated by other forms of division, difference, disjuncture, and so on and so forth. Uh, the other, but at the same time, it is not only a matter of conflict and the physiognomy of the conflict or how the conflict is organized, how it is managed and how it's handled. But as one of the most important point made in Craig's chapters is democracy does not control its own destiny that it is not a, a entirely autonomous proposition, that more than anything else in modern times, without going too back into it, capitalism is the socioeconomic formation, whether in fact it emerged as Tocqueville and Stephen have suggested following Tocqueville, emerged out of a democratic formation or not, it is clearly the tail that is wagging the democratic society, democratic political. <laughs> As a result, when we think in terms of conflict, this is where, you know, change, how the change reorganizes the conflict. And especially in a modern society, in a modern capitalist society, where speed is escalating. That's why Craig's emphasis on double movement in Poliani's notion about the first movement, second movement, and the so-called Engels gap, which he talks about, which are all very important. So as a result, we have to see about how conflict and change are playing out in modern contemporary society, including what Charles was talking about, opaqueness, which has increased in a modern capitalist society, just the way as when Jason Harson was trying to point out about how the new technology has dramatically transformed this conflict in terms of technology. So it is, it is a very complex kind of a phenomena about when we talk about conflict, cannot be reducible to the pro, you know, so-called um, uh, the liberals as opposed to populist or the Republican, it's far more complex. Now, the second issue that arises is on the other side, you know, bracketing this social conflict. The question is whether a particular political form, a particular mode of governing and constituting oneself as a political community. Of course, now dominant being the nation state, although under duress by the globalization, whether that political community called nation state is best able to manage conflict and change by democratic means, whether democracy is the proper, more resilient, 
kind of a model or a mode of government to dealing with this issue. Now here, you know, there's a kind of a consensus has emerged over a period of time. It has been, or at least people say, you see, this is one of the paradox with which we begin. At some time, people say constantly, in my essay I say, constantly people say democracy is in crisis and they identify several various regimes which are undermining democracy from within. And yet all of those people who are undermining democracy from within, let's say Orban's Hungary, they keep democratic frame. You know, in, in the sense, there doesn't seem to be an alternative to a democratic form of government. That is in fact the first and overwhelming paradox. You can talk about crisis in democracy, you can write hundreds of books, but at the same time, democracy seems to be still the only legitimate, only machinery which is capable of generating some kind of legitimacy. So you can make a distinction between pseudo-democracy, you know, uh, illiberal democracy, and so on and so forth. But somehow a democratic form remains. This raises a question as to what do we mean by democracy? Exactly, right? I mean, this is where the question about, you know, to what extent, you see, you know, for instance, um, uh, Julian mentioned Dal, you know, that whole uh, Dal to Huntington, the whole model, where once upon a time, all they in, used to emphasize is the centrality of electoral process, that what democracy meant was democracy or the method, it is a method by which one elected Usually, the people elected one elite or another by a democratic method. And, and that was privileged far more than liberal values or other normative goals. Now, of course, the, the, the anxiety basically is that elections are not going the way Dahl and Huntington and before that Schumpeter thought they were going to go forever. They have gone, you know, they're going somewhat differently. So this raises the question, and this is where I think I want to sort of leap over because of a time of time, because of the need for time, to the very interesting point which Stephen has raised, right? About popular sovereignty versus popular governance. And then also he's introduced the question about democratic society and democratic governance. He makes a very interesting point saying, you know. Royal sovereign under royal sovereignty, you could imagine a slow emergence and evolution of popular governance. The, that is, under the royal sovereignty, you could hear see a mode in which people, the voices, their interests are being addressed in a certain way. But this whole situation changes dramatically about what would popular governance mean under popular sovereignty. I mean, this is where I think the classic issue about somebody like Lincoln's definition of government of the people, by the people, for the people, creates such a difficulty as to how is this proposition, government of the people, by the people, for the people, is going to be operationalized. You know, the entire idea about representative government and the attack and dissatisfaction with representative government you see around here. And very often representative system itself was seen as a elite formation, representation. When you look at the founding father, when they say at some point is a modern large society like United States is representative form necessary because you can't all meet face to face like in the, in the, in the Athenian direct democracy, which wasn't that direct after all. The question is whether it is necessary or is it desirable? The idea it's seen as desirable for a variety of reasons that not just necessary, suggest in some way the representative system was in many ways is as you know Craig has emphasized, is a particular way of trying to curb the excesses of popular sovereignty by variety of mechanisms, which could one could call Republican or Republican institutions and so on and so forth. So the, but at the same time, this, this internal contradiction that gov people do not govern by themselves and the various ways in which representative government could lead to not attending to the needs of the people, which is what brings back this kind of populist reaction 
or populist pressure. And I think, in my view, that is never going to go away insofar as political conflict will continue to mirror the economic and cultural conflict. So the question basically about how does one negotiate this particular form? In the same way, the French revolutionary slogan, liberty, equality, you know, and solidarity, we are talking more today about solidarity and equality rather than about liberty, because there may be a particular way in which you can narrativize liberty as American historians tend to do, that America is a sign of progressive deepening promise of liberty. But that is something American cannot do, American history cannot do, that in fact, what we see in terms of the struggle for a just society or equitable, relatively equitable society, you see what you see is a constant fluctuation. And this is where I think capitalism, Poliani, double movement and all incredibly central. And so are the issues raised by Stephen. And, you know, obviously Stephen is responding to Craig, the issue of scale, right? I mean, sort of an issue of scale creates a very complex situation in terms of representative government, governance, and so on and so forth. So, so, the, so the question really is equality issue or inequality is a far more complex one than the sheer question of human rights, liberty, negative liberty, or so on and so forth. Not that they are perfectly realized in countries like India, it's much more complex, you know. But nevertheless, I think this tension within the democratic form, within whether it is a question about popular sovereignty or popular government, and also between this idea about how we can never assure a straight trajectory where inequality is kept under control or class conflict is left under control. It keeps being reconfigured and you have to do something about it. And the question is whether a democratic form of government is resilient enough, swift enough to do, deal with transforming structure of inequality. And I think that is an important one. This is where I think, you know, I want to, you know, engage Stephen on this question. You know, the, you know, as opposed to popular sovereignty, popular government, as opposed to royal sovereignty and popular government, I think that's a very interesting point. I need to think about it more. But when he shifts over to democratic society and democratic government, my anxiety about that distinction about democratic society and democratic government, whether Stephen is really making a distinction between a liberal society and democratic society, where, or, or is it the case, he's, when he refers to democratic society, he's pretty much talking about a liberal society. A liberal society has many, many, or while it is in many, you know, endorses democratic form of government, and sees it as closely aligned to having elective affinity with democratic form of government. I'm not so sure that the history of liberalism, even for somebody like Fukuyama, who is now beginning to say liberalism and discontents, whether liberalism left to its own devices is capable of not undermining certain kind of democratic forms, practices, and norms. So I would want to know exactly how we mean by democratic society. You know, is democratic society a particular way of talking about civil society in a classical sense of the word? So I have always had this some difficulty about when people, you know, about idea of democratic society, what does it mean as opposed to you know, I can understand democratic culture, you know, democratic norms and things like that. But nevertheless, I would like to get Stephen, because I think it is a very interesting question which he has raised. And I think I see the a lot of things I also hear here, you know, Rosen Vallon also has raised some of these issues. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in listening to that. And for me, that third path, the third option, non-legislative, non-executive, non-judiciary, that is a social movement, 
sometimes molecular, sometimes molar, that is, you know, direct action of certain kinds, is a absolute necessary for keeping pressure on the democratic form and by implication, keeping pressure on elite rule, which is unavoidable in my opinion, to some extent. And it is equally necessary to keep the Republican institutions under you know, a sufficient amount of pressure so that democratic project, a TILIC project can continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe we'll take just, just one minute for each, uh, Stephen, um, Ilaria, and Julian, if they have just a brief comment, one minute each before we, we end here, since we we're responding to what they were saying, and they might want to say something back. Um, Stephen, go ahead. Um, thank you very much uh, for, for those responses, and uh, it's sort of extraordinary how quickly this has gone. Um, but uh, and I would just have so much more to say. I, in terms of democratic society uh, in, in, in one minute, um, I guess uh, the, the quickest way to respond is that this is how I read the second volume of Capitalist Democracy in America. Mm. That is, that it is, that is that, um, it, it, it is first and foremost an equality of condition. To my mind, Chuck Phillips, he uses the word civil society in that volume four times. Now he does say, one of those is to say it's the entire structure within which he's, he's writing the book. But by that, he means a distinction between civil society, religious society, and political society. Those three, that, that tripartite distinction in the kinds of society date back to, they exist in all times and in all places. So he does not see civil society in some of the ways that you would see in the Scottish Enlightenment as something that would emerge in the 18th century thanks to capitalism or in the Hegelian sense of a kind of late um, historical development. To his, he thinks civil society is something that exists in all times and in all places. What he does think is new is what he calls democratic society. And it's defined by this equality of condition and we can talk extensively about what he means by that, but he obviously does not mean equality, he means an equality of condition, which is not the same thing as a liberal society, as I would understand it, which is essentially a notion of a sovereign individual uh, with a private and public distinction, with um, uh, a sort of rights-based notion of, of the individual. It's, it's very much a kind of notion of a social individual born out of inequality of condition. And what he argues, to my mind, is that capitalism sits on top of that and actually takes advantage of it. And the reason he thinks capitalism take, cannot take off, and he's actually quite explicit about this in Democracy in America, it's capitalism is not, why, it's not the tail wagging the democratic dog, because um, unless democ democratic society allows it to do so by not governing itself democratically. And therefore, aristocratic society is actually quite resistant to capitalism, or at least has a whole set of mechanisms that resist capitalist society and prevent it from taking over uh, in the ways that it can in democratic society. Um, so uh, so I'd, have, I'd have much more to say on that, and I do hope we'll be able to continue this conversation. But thank you very much to all of you for, uh, for these comments. Great. Ilaria, do you have any last comments you want to, anything that? Yeah, so conflict in one minute. That's my, <laughs> my turn. So I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, I want to try to overlap the distinction I draw between like good or emancipatory uh, conflict <laughs> and bad or oppressive conflict with the distinction uh, that was made between social conflict and political conflict. So that's one way I think that it's still fruitful to distinguish two types of conflict in the sense that if we agree that social conflict is the conflict that comes from economic inequality, and I agree with that, um, that's of course the type of conflict that we would call oppressive conflict, right? Because there is but like, and it depends in which countries, you know, like how much you can go from a different uh, economic situation to another. But 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 then you said something about irreconcilable political identities, right? And that's the type of conflict where I want to say, well, this is good conflict in a sense, or emancipatory conflict, exactly because they are irreconcilable, and we don't want to 
hide these different identities, but exactly because we can, we want, because they exist and we have to face them. That's also a way, like bringing this conflict up is a way to enrich the teleconcept of democracy. Um, and as, just two quick point about this. When I, like, I don't think if we consider a teleconcept as a blueprint necessarily means that this cannot change because a blueprint can be as contingent as it can be, right? So we have a blueprint today for what we think. So what we consider security, for example, today is different from what we would consider as security 200 years ago, right? And for, for us today, what we mean is still a blueprint because we still there is still this gap with what we think about democracy and what we think about and what we can uh, realize in the practice. And one very last thing, again, on conflict and, and, and opacity. Um, I think that exactly because conflict is ineliminable, ineliminable um, institutionalizing conflict, the get the, the good emancipatory type of conflict is a way, or even like making obvious or making transparent even the conflict that we don't like, that we want to fight uh, against, is a way to fight against opacity. Because the other option we have is, in a sense, to pretend that there is not this conflict, right? So um, I think institutionalizing channels for conflict is a way exactly to counteract this opacity that is pervading uh, more and more the democratic culture. And so, yeah, I would be curious to see if you think that this is a way to actually manage conflict as because as you said we can't get rid of it right so we have to do something with it in any case <laughs> julian um very very quick i just want to explain briefly my motivation for trying to distinguish between the european and the uh, american case which is that my impression of my analysis of what has been taking place in in eastern Europe since the 1990s and the, the problems of especially liberal democracy have partly to do with the fact that um, democratic liberal triumphalism after the 1990s suggested that um, it would already be clear <coughs> that the countries, Eastern European countries would become suggesting that necessarily they would become liberal um, democracies, thereby their future was already predetermined um, by supposed laws of of history, as if in uh, Hegelian absolute spirit, which would would reign through um, uh, the march of of, of history, um, and that I think generates a lot of opposition because people want to determine their own history, which is essentially the one of the key ideas, of course, of of democratic forms of of government. And therefore, it's important to say also to the European Democrats, hey. Um, yes, this is going on in the US and these are problems, you face similar problems, but there's still room for maneuver, it looks different, it can also go in a different direction, and so um, paying attention to the particularities of the distinct democratic projects, local, regional, national, international, seems very important for the sake of democracy. Great, thank you very much. Um, I think we should probably end it there. We're almost hitting the two hour mark. Um, so I want to um, give uh, my immense thanks to Craig, Delip, Charles, Ilaria, Julian, Stephen, and Zach for helping organize this tonight for everyone attending. There are 40 to 50 people in Zoom land out there. We're going to put this up on YouTube and we look forward to continuing the conversation, hopefully with you guys maybe in Paris one of these days soon. And big okay. thanks to Jason. <laughs> Thank you, Great Jason. idea. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you. Cool.